Good evening and welcome. I'm Tracy with KOGMissions.com, Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions. And tonight Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Tracy excuse with KOGMissions.com, Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions. I need to somewhere and turn this off. Okay, sorry about that. We'll get back here to live. And uh, as I'm waiting for uh, Brother Anthony to get on, I have a few things to uh, share with you. And as I was mentioning that uh, the ministry that I work with is Kingdom of God, Ministry and Missions. And tonight my guest is going to be Anthony Buzzard from Focus on the Kingdom. And we're going to discuss the importance of Jesus's kingdom teachings. Jesus said that we have been given the opportunity to know the secrets of the kingdom. But before we start that, I'd like to show you a new project that we've been working on. It's a basic Bible lessons. And Anthony and I are doing some basic Bible lessons on this very important topic and some other ones as well. And a lot of it is addressed in the booklets that he has, uh, what happens when we die and who is Jesus. And so I'll pull up here uh, the, the page on the website. It's sort of live, not totally yet though. And uh, you can check this out. Uh, I have started uploading some of the lessons we've been doing here. We have an intro where um, Anthony's discussing uh, about accepting Jesus. You hear a lot of times uh, we accept Jesus or accept Jesus into your heart. And we look at what that really means. And then um, we have the first lesson on the kingdom hope. And we will be having some uh, links here as well to other material that you can study. And of course, you can be going through the what happens when we die or who is Jesus booklets as well. And so far, we have up there the kingdom hope, uh, what happens when we die, talking about the nature of man, death, and you know what's that all about? And about hell, the grave, and Gehenna. And we also have the two resurrections when Jesus comes, the first one, and then after that, the 1,000 years. And then hopefully later tonight uploaded will be the difficult texts on life after death uh, about the kingdom and, you know, like about Lazarus and uh, all, all those ones that people usually question us. What about this? What about that? And then hopefully shortly after that, um, the, we'll be doing a, on the Who is Jesus booklet, uh, the death of Jesus, resurrection, difficult texts. And then we will uh, work our way through that and do a little bit on Holy Spirit and being born again. And at the bottom, we have some great links for some Q&As, Bible guides, Anthony's uh, new Bible and commentary, and then Dick Eldred's biblical truths here, all worth taking a look at. And I'm really excited that the New Testament online commentary is now going to have um, him reading it as well on there. Really grateful to Simply Christian and our sister Lorene putting that together to have so we can listen along as we are um, enjoying the, the Bible and commentary that Anthony has worked really hard. And not only Anthony, but I know Sarah and uh, Carlos have invested a lot of time in that as well, especially Sarah. So I'm really grateful for that as well. And tonight, like I mentioned, um, Anthony is going to be on here. And I will bring him up here now. And welcome, Anthony. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you for all that uh, good introducing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can you're see welcome. You. I can see so, you now beautifully. Yes, great. So tonight we're going to be talking about the secrets of the kingdom. Yep. And to our listeners, if you have any questions, please put them in all caps in the chat, uh, preferably a little bit later so we don't lose them in the chat. But all caps would be great so we can see them better, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. And please do, though, keep them on topic. The topic is the kingdom of God tonight. Uh, we won't be taking questions on other topics. And just be clear with your question and succinct, please. So, um, Anthony, people yep. can see from the names of our ministries that we're focused on Jesus' kingdom message. Yes, and that reality of the coming kingdom of God, which I'm excited about. I know you're excited yes. about it. And Jesus obviously was because he talked about it 
you know, his whole ministry and even after yes. he was resurrected. And uh, the other day you and I were talking when we were mm -hmm. working on those other lessons and you brought up Luke 8, uh, 4 through 15 about the parable of the sower and the seed. Yes. And we know that's one of the most important teachings of Jesus. And not only did he tell parables or stories, but he also explained them. And so we're going to take a look at that a little bit later mm -hmm. so we can find out what the meaning is. His disciples came and said, tell us yes. you know, what you mean there. But one thing you quoted to me that really hit me and that inspired this live stream was you you quoted Luke 8, 12. Yes. How the devil comes yes. to take away the word of the kingdom from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. Yes. And I'm really concerned about this generation and any future ones. Because yes. traditional and evangelical Christianity, yes. they threw this teaching out long ago and replaced it with unbiblical and even pagan teachings of an immortal soul mm -hmm. going to heaven as a believer's reward. Mm -hmm. But what even concerns me most is we don't hear this preached a whole lot, even in a lot of our own churches. And yep. those that understand who God is, that he really is one. Mm -hmm. And this essential teaching seems to be slipping away from the sermons, Sunday yes. school, and even conversations amongst brethren. Yes. And it's being twisted into other, you know, the, the evangelical language. And so Jesus said, seek God's kingdom first. Yes. You know, he was commissioned to talk about it and to teach it and to preach it his entire ministry. And then the 40 days after his resurrection. Yes. And it was his focus and his purpose. And after his death and resurrection, he didn't change what we should seek first. So why do you think most of Christendom has done this? Um, what they've done is to say, we don't really care about the teachings of Jesus. To sum it up, most of the public, much of the public think, oh, Jesus died for my sins and rose. That's the gospel. That's all I need. I need to be re reassured that I've been forgiven. That, of course, is true. But what they've left out is the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom. Because we make this point right away that for several years in his ministry he didn't even mention his death there's only way to get to mass mm -hmm. matthew 16 he began it says to start talking about his death but what has happened to the initial ministry of jesus it's all about the kingdom of god that's unarguable this is why it's such a fun subject because there's nothing to debate here it's just a plain fact that jesus was obsessed with the kingdom and you and I have talked about Luke 4.43 a lot. We, and I do recommend the verses that we mentioned. We do want you to take them down in your notes and use them immediately because there's nothing more fun than talking about the world's destiny and your destiny, especially in these very troubled times we're living in. So Luke exactly. 4.43 is great. That's the reason I was sent. Wait a minute. That is Christianity. I must preach the gospel about the kingdom of God to the other cities also. That's why God commissioned me. That is brilliant, Tracy, isn't it? It's a purpose statement. Americans love purpose statements. Well, go for it. Tell your friends because nobody knows about it. They just don't. Exactly. And I think the answer really as mm. to, you know, what happened to this is what you mentioned in Luke 8, 12. Absolutely. That Satan does not want believers to have this hope and That's this right bright outlook of the future it's very dark today and it's getting darker and people yes. are depressed and you look at the world and you think what's going on but with I the hope of the kingdom mm. we can have that light and it will help us to get through these hard times absolutely luke 8 12 is very good and i must confess i only discovered that probably a year ago but the devil knows better than church members what this is all about when anybody hears the message of the kingdom, that's what the parallel is in Matthew 13. When anybody hears this gospel about the coming kingdom of God, the devil comes and does his level best to take away that word, that message of the kingdom. You have to keep repeating that phrase, the word of the kingdom. We've got it in parenthesis rightly there. The devil's trying to get it out of your mind so that... You would not believe the message of the kingdom and get saved. Excuse me. This is about salvation. So we've got to completely undo the false teaching out there that the only thing that matters is the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's very important. But the teaching of Jesus, the apostles are so clever, uh, Tracy, because they saw in uh, 
the letters of John, it says, if anybody doesn't bring the teaching of Jesus, watch out. Paul said exactly the same thing in 1 Timothy 6, 3. If anybody comes to you and doesn't bring the teaching of Jesus, watch out, you're being scammed. Mm -hmm. I hope the public realizes that. You're being taken in, you're being fooled on the only question that really matters at all. Well, and I think it, by doing that, he's getting our focus or people's focus on everything else yes. but this message. I mean, you see the books that Christian writers put out, and there's so many different things out there, and they're all good, and yes. they should be a part of our Christian walk yes. in our life. Yes. But if you don't have the message of the kingdom, those other things really don't matter. And you mentioned here that to believe and be saved, but I would even go as far as say that is our salvation. If you're looking for salvation oh, yes. in the kingdom, and that resurrection and immortality, that is our salvation. It's our inheritance and our hope and our future uh, salvation, as you rightly said. And we can go back to the beginning of Mark. This is an amazing statement. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Mark, with his heading over the whole book, it says <laughs> the beginning, excuse me, the beginning of the gospel. And it doesn't say... Jesus died for you and rose. That's absolutely crucial, but it's not the beginning of the gospel. And Jesus talked about not laying the right foundation. And he said, many people are going to be very disappointed when they're told, get out of here. You weren't preaching the right message. You thought you were, but you were deceived and you didn't lay the right foundation. So we're, we're really encouraging our audience to lay the foundation in Mark chapter one, verse one, the beginning of the gospel. And then as you go down to the 14th and 15th verses in that Mark 1, it says that Jesus came into Galilee preaching God's gospel. That's not good news that God exists. It's God's good news, the good news that he gives out to the world. He loves the world and he wants to give it good news. And then, well, you say, what is this good news? Well, in the 15th verse, Jesus said, here's the good news. You're to repent. That's to say, change your mind, give up thinking the way you've been thinking wrongly, and believe, that's a command, that's not an option. Not if you feel like it, you want to believe the gospel about the kingdom. So I recommend to anybody listening to these um, good programs that Tracy's organized for us, you should always use the phrase gospel of the kingdom. And since you had Luke 8, 12 up there, here's a very easy memory device. Acts 8, 12, it says, when they believe Philip, Guess what Philip was preaching about? The gospel of the kingdom of God. Only when they believed, then they were ready to be baptized in water. And of course, water baptism is an absolutely non-negotiable um, mm -hmm. effort on your part, command from Jesus. You must be baptized in water. But that's Acts 8, 12, Luke 8, 12. Those are very revolutionary statements from our master rabbi, Jesus, who was a teacher like no teacher ever before. The people marveled at his teaching because he spoke with such certainty and authority, <laughs> unlike many of their religious leaders in the day. Well, Anthony, you mentioned believing because belief yes. or faith, is, it's action. It yes. tells us that even the demons believe there's one God and shudder. But that just because you believe that, if you don't do anything with no, it no. and walk in obedience, that belief isn't getting you into the kingdom. I don't think Satan and the no. demons will be in the kingdom just because they believe and know that, which they know better than half of Christendom. That's right. who Believing God is. is a bit, you're absolutely right. The text on that one that's really nails it is Hebrews 5, 9, which says that salvation, catch this now, is given to those who obey Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's a very good summary statement. It's rather like John 3, 36 which says if you don't believe in the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom, you're in very bad shape. And if you do believe in it, you're doing well. You're going to get the life of the age to come, which is eternal life, badly translated in many of our, our Bibles. So it's everything. Your destiny depends on your believing the gospel about the kingdom. That's absolutely unarguable. Your friends can't argue with that. It's just a plain fact. So that's why it's so exciting to talk about it. And then you need to do something with it. Yes. And, you know, you mentioned exciting. I, I'm excited, too. And I don't see how people think it can get boring. I mean, how many years have we been uh, working on this? Probably together over 100. I, I know <laughs> for 40 years I've been in love with this message when I yes. first heard it. Over 40, probably. Yes. And you a lot longer. And I've never once been bored, bored about it. Even no. talking now with you, uh, I'm excited. We could go on for hours and hours. We're Absolutely. not going to do that. but. 
Yes. Uh, it is an exciting topic to talk about. And I think, Anthony, yes. we need to return to focusing on the kingdom. Absolutely. We conscientiously. Do. I've got a paper in front of me. I don't really know where this came from. I happen to find it on, on the Internet some weeks ago, and I saved it kind of by mistake. Then I got it out. I thought, this is incredible. I don't even know who wrote this, but he says this. What is the kingdom of God? Question mark. It is God's salvation plan for this fallen world. And he gets it 100% right. I'm going to try and track him down if I can. If he happens to be listening to this, I want to know who he is because I want to talk to him. And let me just mention this to you today that we heard from England, some people in an old people's home, they've suddenly come to understand this kingdom. And they're a bit nervous now about their church experience in the mm -hmm. nursing home because the people there are not so happy with what we're saying. So they've been in correspondence with me. actually a couple. Both of them are pastors. They're both teachers. And they're very thrilled to have found the one God and the kingdom of God. So this is what we do all day. I find this very interesting. What would be more interesting than this? Well, praise the Lord. And Jesus did warn us that it is going to, we are going to go through suffering on our way to that That's kingdom. Right. And if he suffered, what are we to expect that we wouldn't either? And And to remember that, our message is not our message. It's his message. It's what he preached, what the father gave to him to do. Right. And he passed it on to us to do that. So I think maybe, Anthony, we need to give a quick definition of the biblical meaning of God's kingdom. Because if you're talking yes. to typical uh, evangelicals, if you mention the kingdom of God, they're, yeah, yeah, they believe they believe that. So would you yes. please explain to our listeners what is meant yes. by kingdom? What is this kingdom? Yes. It's not some fuzzy thing. Um, but no. what do we mean when we talk about it? Well, the first point to be made there, Tracy, is that when Jesus was around, everybody knew. You didn't have to explain it all the time. When he met Nicodemus, you know, at night, and he immediately says, you've got to be born again to enter the kingdom. They knew what that was. It's like saying there's an election coming up. We don't have to explain what that is in America. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about the coming election. The kingdom of God is mainly, primarily, and predominantly that state of affairs on earth, a worldwide empire, not kingship. No, no, that's just to waffle the whole thing away. It's a kingdom. And the book, of course, to study the kingdom is Daniel, particularly chapter 2 and chapter 7. Daniel talks about world empires. So forget the idea of going to heaven when you die as a disembodied soul. How boring is that? It's completely <laughs> false. If you've got that in your mind as being the definition of the king, you really have to change your mind on that. No, it's a worldwide empire of the future in which Jesus will have come back to the earth, not in a preacher of rapture, but one time, one visible, spectacular mm -hmm. return known mm -hmm. as the parousia in Greek. And we're using the modern Greek pronunciation because that's the way Greeks understand it today and hear it. So Jesus is actually coming back to be the world governor. Mm -hmm. That is so exciting to me because on the news, all they talk about is who's going to take charge of this mess. That's the only thing they talk about. Right. Well, I've got something to tell them. I, I would like to get on that Fox News thing in the morning and, and say what I'm saying now to the whole world. That would be fun. But government is everything, isn't it? You've got to have things in order. And right now we have anarchy. You've seen these pictures of people, people slamming the glass on the top of jewelry and things. I mean, this is unthinkable anarchy. Well, in the kingdom of God, Jesus, who has all authority, will be able to put a stop to that. You won't be able to build a tank and threaten your neighbor. You won't have a gun ready to shoot your neighbor. This is unthinkable. It's peace on earth. It's paradise restored. It's the Garden of Eden restored. So we're back to where Adam failed. You see, Jesus was very smart. He knew the Bible well, grew up reading the Bible. He said, oh, okay, Adam. I'm the second Adam, he said. Mm -hmm. Adam's job was to rule the world. That's what God wanted him to do. Adam failed dismally. We know that. And so Jesus is the one saying, I'm the one who's recruiting the rulers for this coming kingdom. And that's what he's doing with you and me. And we are going to be tested because you don't put people in charge of anything until you've tested them. So if you're getting tried or tested in your life, that's part of the game because God wants to know what's in your heart through various testings before he's going to let, let you lose on five or ten cities. Take charge of five or ten cities. Why don't they preach on this all the time? I agree, Anthony. And this message of Jesus's, again, it's not just our message, it's Jesus's yeah. message. Not so. I think, especially in young people today, 
this would help with the passion to have Absolutely. you know a passion for something and a purpose yes what are people's passion and purpose today uh, this is something that's way bigger than us and that's exactly right you what mentioned that God, yeah. government i'm sorry what were you saying well, i was going to say this is a famous book called the purpose driven church and well no amazingly <laughs> yes it's a famous book but it doesn't really go into the kingdom my good man you have missed the whole point the purpose driven church means that you know what the purpose of the world is you know what the christian purpose is and it's now training you men and women and as you said the young people too can have this vision of being part of the first successful world government ever we've all failed in, di in dismal ways jesus is going to repair all that he's going to be in charge and the world will be under new management. I like that, under new praise management. The Lord. That's the, yes, mm -hmm. praise the Lord. That is in fact the Christian destiny. I like that word destiny. Mm -hmm. So until you get hold of that and you read your Bible now anew, especially Matthew 13, Mark 4 and Luke 8, which are the parable chapters, and especially the parable of the sower. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute we'll here. I think moment. we have some good stuff there. I just yeah. wanted to touch again on, you mentioned yes. the government or the empire on the yeah. earth. Yeah. So yeah. it is on the earth. Yes. And it, Jesus is not ruling, quote, over the earth, like up in the sky. He's no, ruling no, no. over the entire planet, just of like, course. you know, you've said the queen rules all over England. She's not She's, up in the sky. That's right. But when we think of government, empire, kingdom, yes, there's a location. Yes. There's a capital. Yes. You have to have a ruler and you have to have subjects. You have to have subjects it's and you have to have co-rulers. Yes. Absolutely right. I mean, there is a group out there who says that Jesus is going to rule over the earth, meaning he's going to be in heaven. That is quite simply wrong. The whole mm -hmm. point of the kingdom is it will be on the earth because the king will be at the capital of the kingdom. And guess where the capital of the kingdom is? It's Jerusalem. You can go there today. You won't find the Messiah ruling. But that's going to happen. So we have to actually undo all of the popular errors and misconceptions mm -hmm. in order to get this thing clear in people's minds. Mm -hmm. That was the next point I wanted to bring up. Yeah. You were reading my mind that Jesus is God's appointed king. And he's totally. going to rule and govern you know, with us. And in Psalm 2, I believe, it talks about ruling from Zion. Absolutely. Yeah. You're exactly right that Jesus is the appointed king. He's the Mashiach, a pretty Hebrew word, Mashiach with a kind of a guttural CH at the end. It means Messiah. All the kings of Israel in the past, the kings of Judah and the kings of the Northern Kingdom, they were all Messiahs. They were anointed kings. Many of them failed very badly. They mm -hmm. didn't do well, especially in, in the uh, Southern Kingdom. They were a disaster. But that's going to be repaired when Jesus comes back as the Messiah, the final son of man, the final Messiah, Daniel 7, is the whole story in 28 verses. Daniel 7 is your bedtime reading for the next mm -hmm. six months at least till you've got it totally memorized. Exactly. And you touched on this, and we're not going to get in this into this tonight, yeah. but I did want to mention that there are two phases here. We have the first phase, which is a thousand years. Yes. And that is not what most people think of as no more death, dying, tears, and all that. That comes after the white throne judgment when death itself is destroyed. And so we have yeah. that first phase of the thousand years and then the quote eternal that goes on forever and ever after yes. the white throne judgment. So we have a little um, difference yes. there in those parts of the kingdom. The first thousand years is known as the millennium mm -hmm. and that begins at the future parousia or second coming of mm -hmm. Jesus. And that is a restricted resurrection. It's not the resurrection of everybody that happens only after the thousand years. So that's very important. It's called the millennium. There's been a great struggle on what's the millennium. Is it now or is it future? That shouldn't be difficult. I'll tell you why. Because it says in Revelation 20, which is the great millennium chapter, it says that people who had been beheaded came to life. That's not conversion. It's nothing to do with being converted now. You're not beheaded when you're converted. That's just... <laughs> absolutely unreasonable no your beheaded means you m were martyred for the faith it's not only the martyrs all of the true believers from abraham and isaac and jacob and all the prophets jesus said when you see abraham and isaac and jacob in the kingdom jesus said this and yourselves being cast out because you weren't prepared 
there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The one disappointment that none of us wants to, uh, to uh, we all need to avoid absolutely, would be rejection from the kingdom. You remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is being taken away from you. That is about as tough and horrifying as you could possibly say. So mm -hmm. your objective as a true believer is to seek first the kingdom of God and all the right living that goes with that, all the mm -hmm. righteousness. So, and you're to pray, thy kingdom come. You've noticed that in the Lord's Prayer, the word kingdom occurs twice, mm -hmm. both at the beginning and the end. May your kingdom come. Yes, Lord, send your kingdom because we're in bad shape right now. Well, and he even so, says on yes, earth. Yes. He's on earth, on about earth. being on earth. As, so, as it is in heaven, yes. So you mentioned a little earlier about how God created the paradise. We were talking about the Garden of Eden. And yes. right now we're in this process of him bringing us back to that state and the earth back Absolutely. to that state of paradise. And in yes. Genesis 5, 29, yes. uh, it was said of Noah, it says, this one will bring us comfort from our labor and from the painful toil of our hands because of the ground that the Lord has cursed. Yes, Why I love that. Hard now. It wasn't hard for Adam and Eve when they started. No, that's exactly right. This kingdom idea is repeated in the Bible. There are sort of uh, foretastes of it, <laughs> rehearsals for it, if you like. And so every time we have a new day, a new day dawning, you're to think of the kingdom of God. Every time the sun gets up in the morning, brightness replaces dark. Dark is chaos and doom, dismal things, and light is the symbol of the kingdom. That's why you're praying, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on the earth, not in the sky. So the first thing is to get rid of the idea that so-and-so has died and passed away and gone to heaven. That's absolutely false. I'll repeat this rather poor illustration. But if you go to a soccer match and you think that the object of the game is to kick the ball as high as you can into the air, you'd say, well, that's pretty stupid. That's the way people are not thinking like the Bible. And some of them find reading the Bible difficult. Well, of course they do, because they've got the wrong scheme. We want them to have the scheme of the kingdom on the earth mentioned five times in Psalm 37. Five times over, the meek are going to inherit the earth. The public kind of knows this, because they do read their Bibles, but they need some very vigorous teaching to make it clear to them. Well, and Anthony, they would agree with you for everything you've said, yes, but they, they so. still don't understand it. They need to have it explained to them. Yes. It's not enough just to talk about the kingdom, because when you say that, they have a different perception of what that is. That's exactly right. And I've, as you say that, my eye falls on Matthew 13, 51, where Jesus, having given this parable of the sower, all the parables are about the kingdom. Having given all that, he said then, as a good teacher, have you understood all these things? That's a very good point. Teachers need to say, do you get, do you understand it? And if they haven't understand, you go on until they do. That's a good teaching method in, in Matthew 13, 51. Have you understood all these things? And they said, yes. Well, yeah. not only Anthony to understand, my kids, when I talk about then they, oh, we've already heard this before because you hear it <laughs> over. And I say, are you able to teach it to somebody else? Well, Good. no. Well, then you haven't heard it enough. That's right. And only so when they teach we have it. all the people in our churches that are able to share this good news of the coming yeah. kingdom. And I mean, just start there. But if you're not able to do that and you don't have that in you, we're, we're, we're just really taken back of what Jesus told us to do. And we're not Absolutely. prepared. That's um, right. We mentioned from Genesis there about the Lord cursing the ground. And if we look at Romans yes. 8, 8 mm -hmm. 18 through 22, I'll just read that here. For I consider our present suffering yes. not even be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed to us. Yes. For the creation, so the whole earth, not just us, eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected yes. to futility, not willingly, but because God because of God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free That's from right. the bondage of decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers together until now. It's not just us groaning and suffering. No, no. All of creation is. That's a very good passage there. People don't know what we might call the synonyms of the Bible. If you don't know that... Uh, the president, if you talk about the president of America, you're really talking about the president of, of USA. You're not talking about the president of the local bank. 
people don't know the synonym. So you mentioned an excellent word, the word glory there. It speaks of the glory that's going to be revealed in us, not just to us. We're going to say, oh, isn't that wonderful? No, no, we are going to be glorified. Mm -hmm. And actually, Jesus is going to give us a prize for what we do if we're successful. We've been using Colossians 3.24 quite a bit, which speaks of the inheritance as your reward. Reward. I stress the word reward because Calvin did a lot of damage to the faith when he said that we're such miserable failures, we human beings. We can't do anything right. Well, there's a certain truth in that. We are prone to failure. I get that. But God is going to reward people for what they do. Well done, Tracy. You worked mm -hmm. hard at this. Now let me show you what I'm going to give you. Hallelujah. Why not? That's the way the story goes. Every good father rewards his children, doesn't he? Exactly. Automatically. Yes. You're thrilled when they do well. God is, uh, is exactly like that. He's going to reward. So you have a reward now stored up in heaven. The reward is not to go to heaven, but the reward is stored up. God is very waiting, very much waiting and passionately excited about that day when he can reward his followers with the prize of being in charge of five, ten cities. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite practical. I understand that because we know what government is. We know it. We all know about that. So think of government. Think of Daniel 2. Think of Daniel 7. That's where you start. Luke 4.43, Acts 8.12, mm -hmm. Luke 8.12. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you do all the kingdom verses in Acts because most people still think, well, when we get to Acts, they didn't preach the kingdom anymore. That was okay for Jesus. Now, Paul was preaching something different. That's absolutely false. And we're going to take a look at those in a little bit here too next. Yes, good. So that'll, that. that'll be good, yes. Well, I think Acts. if we look at what the way that the creation was when God created everything, and it was good, as mm -hmm. he said, um, so that they, they they were given a job to do and it was yes. work but it wasn't a burdensome work that's right and then i think after the fall when god instituted the sabbath that was a reminder because we see in hebrews there 4 9 it says consequently a sabbath rest remains yes. for the people of god there is a sabbath rest coming which i believe is the kingdom yes and that is. doesn't mean we're sitting there doing nothing but it's not going to be a burden. It's going to be a blessing. And we know in Revelation 22, 3, it says, there will no longer be any curse and the throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will worship him. That's wonderful. And that's the, we know the end of the story, Anthony. Yes, it's very important to know the end of the story. If you don't know the end of the story, how can you possibly relate to it with any excitement? And the fact is, I mean, we're not, we're not bragging here or boasting when we say that people don't know this story. I've been working at this for many years, and you have too. And it is not rocket science, as they say. I write to sites offering salvation quite frequently. I did just yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, thank you for your work. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but you're trying to bring us to Christ. Now, I did notice, however, that you didn't mention the gospel of the kingdom. That question throws them, actually. I got to mm -hmm. reply, well, Wait a minute. We said we told you about the salvation. It's it's believing that Jesus died. Wrote, wrote. They didn't even see the question because they're so confused. So then you have to go very patiently and say, yes, we believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. But will you start, please, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then go into Acts? And you rightly said we're going to look at the kingdom text in Acts in a moment if we have time mm -hmm. to show that Paul continued to preach exactly the same gospel of the kingdom. Amen. Well, actually, right now, we'll take a look at those eight okay. uh, kingdom texts and acts, and then we'll move on to discuss Luke 8 yes. and maybe some other parables. So I believe the first one that usually you bring up is uh, chapter 1, verse yes. 3. Yes. Uh, here, and this is just a part of it. If you would like to read it That's from right. your Bible there. Um, I will. But we do see that Jesus was talking about this. This is after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has been resurrected. That in itself is a stupendous miracle. Like he brought Lazarus back from the tomb after he'd been dead for four days. We mustn't take these incredible miracles too lightly. They're staggering. So he was seen, Jesus was, seen by the apostles and anybody else who was along with them over a period of 40 days. That's a period of 40 years, 40 days of trial. You know that, that 40 is the number of trial. It was a kind of a trial period. And Jesus didn't keep coming 
to them after that forever. He finally ascended and stayed there. But for 40 days, he continued his teaching. And guess what he talked about? He talked about the kingdom of God. There was nothing else to talk about. It wasn't the weather. It wasn't the sports, anything else. Because that's the subject that drove Jesus as per Luke 4, 43. Then the next dramatically interesting text after that is Acts 1, 6. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this 40 days, I mean, they've been really pumped up on kingdom stuff from the risen Jesus. Then they say, Lord, breathless with excitement. Mm -hmm. Is this the time now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's to the nation of Israel. That's where the center of the kingdom will be in, in Palestine, as we used to call it, in Israel and across the world. Are we there now? And I want to tell our audience, John Calvin didn't understand this at all. If you're in a Calvinist church, you're not doing very well on this text. Calvin said there are more mistakes in that question than there are words. There are 11 <laughs> words in the Greek there. Calvin did not understand what the kingdom of God was about. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say, you idiots, we're not talking about a kingdom being restored to Israel. Of course it was that. It was never anything else than that. It includes the idea of the restoration of now, blinded what we call Jews, wherever they are, and they're going to be restored. And you can talk to a Jew who knows the Bible well, and you ask him, is the kingdom of God there in Israel right now? He say, no, of course not. Why not? Because the Messiah is not there. You cannot have the kingdom of David until the ultimate David, who is Jesus, is sitting on the throne. You remember the marvelous text in Luke, the Lord God will give Jesus the throne of his ancestor David. And that text should get you so excited. I love that. That's what they're asking about that. It was the right question, not the wrong one. So be careful with Calvinists who don't think that's the right question. And we're reminded of that yeah. in Acts too, where it talks about David and the promise to have totally. someone on the throne. All about David and Abraham. The whole story is built around Abraham and about David and about the new David, the ultimate David, who is Jesus and the saints, the Christians of all the ages. Good. So then... <coughs> We got 812, right. This was the founding text, as you and I well know, of the Abrahamic people in the 1850s even. They fastened on this verse. They said, this is a great summary slogan, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It tells you what you have to believe before you get baptized. So when they believed Philip, who was an, a, a preacher, an evangelist, what was he talking about? Well, guess what? The gospel, good news is, oh, by the way, good news is the same as the gospel. There are some translations, I warn you, which have Jesus preaching good news and Paul preaching gospel. That is an absolute fraud. It's the same word exactly. Evangelion means gospel. Jesus preached the evangelion, the gospel, just as much as Paul preached the evangelion. So they've tried to split it up to make it difficult for you. So if you've got a modern paraphrase that does that, put a red line through that word good news. It is the good news, but it shouldn't be distinguished from the gospel. So when they believe Philip, as he was proclaiming, heralding, that means getting a trumpet and telling the world, whole wide world via internet, possibly, the gospel, that should be about the kingdom of God and everything to, G to do with Jesus. That word name is everything you stand for. It's, if we talk about the name of Tracy, we're not just talking about how to spell T-R-A-C-Y. We're talking about everything that Tracy is and stands for. So all about Jesus, Messiah, that word Christ, of course, simply means Messiah, all about the kingdom. When they got that, when, they, when Philip had said to them, have you understood this? And they said, yes. Okay, now we're going to baptize you in water. Mm -hmm. We were dealing this very day with a person who didn't think that water baptism counted. And I got quite work worked up over that. What do you mean it doesn't count? They were being baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins. And you remember Cornelius, they commanded water. Peter said, well, if you feel like being baptized, you might. No, no, no. He, co he commanded. They got water to baptize him. And even more so than that, in Acts 19, Paul found some people who had only been baptized by John. And so he rebaptized them. Baptism is absolutely non-negotiable, completely required for all Christian people. So well, yes, you should believe these two things. You need to understand this yes. kingdom message of yes. Jesus, and like you said, everything about Jesus, who he was, yes. what he did, 
Exactly. You know, he's the human Messiah. He was crucified and he was resurrected. You need to understand those things. We're of not course. taking that out, but the kingdom of God was his message. And That's you need exactly to understand right. that if you're you're considering baptism. And yes. I think, Anthony, if we look, was it Philip who was preaching to the eunuch? And yes. it said that he wanted to know, explain me, explain to me th these things from the prophet, yes. uh, the prophets. And we don't see the whole conversation there. But in the end, the eunuch says, well, what's keeping me from being baptized? So obviously, Paul, obviously. or not Paul, Philip yeah. talked about those things with him, or he wouldn't have asked that question. Yes, he was uh, exactly right. That eunuch who was uh, coming up to Jerusalem to, to be carrying out some of the religious things as, as a, a proselyte, as attached to the Jewish people, and he was reading the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, mm -hmm. as we say in England, Isaiah in America and uh, then he asked a very good question. He said, well, who am I reading about here? Who is this character in Isaiah 40? And Philip said, well, that's the Messiah and the kingdom. That gave him just exactly the in, the cue for talking about the kingdom. And then it rightly says, they began to be baptized. Not exactly right. They were being baptized. Not they began to be baptized as though, you know, you begin, start, finish. No, mm -hmm. they were getting baptized. You can see them lining up. Mm -hmm. But it was only after they believed the gospel of the kingdom and everything mm -hmm. to do with Jesus Christ. Then they were ready to be Christians. So right. forget about baptizing babies. They can't understand that. It's no, always adult baptism. Only upon an intelligent reception of the great destiny word kingdom. Well, and Jesus said, follow me. If you're not mentally able as a infant yep. to make that decision to follow him you don't you can't make that decision for no. your child no what who they're going to follow or in their life what they're going to believe and follow absolutely um, so acts fourteen twenty two, i believe this yes this one. is very it is yes indeed uh they were preaching here and strengthening the persons the souls means the persons of the disciples and encouraging them, exhorting them to continue in the true Christian faith with these words. This was a summary. We're destined to enter the kingdom. That's the goal. Not we're destined to go to heaven. We're hoping to go to heaven. No, 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 no. Don't ever say that again because you're confusing yourself and your audience. We are destined to enter the future kingdom of God through many persecutions. In John 13, Jesus said, they tried to arrest me. They killed me. I warn you, Jesus said, they're going to try to kill you if you have the truth. So watch out. You're going to be hated by those who don't love the truth as they should. So, yes, good verse, that one, 1422. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 198, there it is. I know these so well because I've been mm -hmm. over them. I find them quite fascinating every time we go over them. There, Paul entered the synagogue, the Jewish place of worship, and spoke out fearlessly, very confidently, for three months. How many Sabbaths is that? That's about, what, uh, four per month. That's about three, four, twelve Saturdays in the synagogue, it was. Not that we are to keep the Sabbath now. We meet on Resurrection Day, which is the first day of the week. And he was addressing them, lecturing, and convincing them. You have to argue these things. You have to argue them in a nice way. You have to persuade them. What was the topic? Of course it was the kingdom of God. There was nothing else to talk about. So these Acts texts on the kingdom are part of your best ammunition when you're explaining this. I hope you do to your friends and your children, anybody who listen. Well, Anthony, here too, where it says fearlessly, yes. you can't preach or teach or even just share with anybody fearlessly yeah. if you yourself are not convinced of it. So Absolutely. the more that we talk about it amongst yeah. ourselves, we're going to be more convinced of it. We're going to be more excited about it. And it's just going to come out second nature in talk Absolutely. to people. And as you said, convincing them. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, uh, we don't we don't want to try to make somebody believe something they don't want. No, we're not making anybody believe it. But we want to convince them, give them evidence so that they have a better chance of uh, accepting this great message. Oh, absolutely. That's a great commission. A yeah. great commission says yeah. that. Jesus didn't say go and just sh share if you feel like it. That, sh that word share is somewhat overdone. <laughs> if you are sharing, but you are to convince them, to argue them into it for their own good, then they can be in the kingdom. And mm -hmm. sometimes that does take a lot of patience and a lot of work, but you stick with it. 
And if it doesn't happen, you shake the dust off and move on. Right. That's all you can do. Mm -hmm. You're a soccer player. You know that scoring goals is not just a, a breeze. It's not easy. You've got to work hard at it. Exactly. Then in Acts 20, you've got these right there, Acts 20 verses. Ah, these two verses I used to say to the students, you could spend the rest of your ministry just preaching these two verses. Why? Because Paul there was summarizing his own ministry, and that's always very instructive. He looked back over his life and said, this is what I've been trying to do. This is the course, the race that I was working at. Mm -hmm. And I don't consider my life worth anything to myself. My life and how long I live is not the issue. What I do care about is that I can successfully finish my task and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. Uh, now I'm breathless. Now, what was that, Paul? What, are you going to tell us? There it is. <laughs> it was to testify. That's a, a legal statement to make a testimony about, to make a, a legal statement from God on God's behalf about the good news of God's grace. Now, evangelicals will tend to stop at that verse. I've been to lectures where they mm -hmm. stop there. They're not going to read the next verse. When you read the 25th verse, he explains what the gospel of grace is. And it is preaching the kingdom in 25. You haven't got 25 up there yet, have you? Um, let's see here. And you get to I've, 25? Yeah. Yep. It didn't ah. help it. And now I know that none of you among whom I went around proclaiming the gospel of that word, proclaiming implies proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. I get it, Paul. I see. You were a kingdom of God preacher just as Jesus was. And what's more, the kingdom of God gospel is exactly synonymous with the gospel of the grace of God. Your friends are going to be shocked to learn that, but that's one of the greatest things you can possibly learn. And Anthony, the part that at the beginning there in 24, that I, I do not consider my life worth anything to myself. Mm. We need to have that attitude, whether we live, you know, I don't right. know, 60 to 100 years now, if we're lucky, you know, what we mm. are, we have here. That's nothing compared even to that first phase of the kingdom of a thousand right. years. So are we willing to sacrifice, let's say, a hundred year right. life, you know, um, now right. and what we want now and what we want to do with our life? It's all about our life, my life. Well, that's yes. not Paul's attitude. He says, I don't consider my life worth anything to myself. Yes. And he wants, his life is uh, to Jesus. I think Galatians 2.20 talks yes. about that. So, Isn't that wonderful? He's a very, and this is very much an American thing. Americans are very good at purpose statements, you know, getting the goal in mind. Paul is a terrific exponent of that, as was Jesus. So that's mm -hmm. what he's doing. Then you get to Acts, uh, you did 19, did we do 19.8 as well? Um, yes, we did. We did yeah, that he entered the synagogue and spoke fearlessly. Um, I, we, we, we did about the kingdom. Yep. We did Acts 20. We did 19.8 before it. Yes, okay. Right, mm, we're going it. in order here. Fine. fine, 28. And then two verses here, 23 and 31. Luke uh, wrote yeah, more yeah, of the I New have Testament. this one on 28, 28, 23, and then yes. I have the next one after Good, that. that's fine. 28, 23. Luke Dr. Luke, probably the only Gentile writer among the Jewish writers of the New Testament, wrote really more of the New Testament than anybody else. If you exclude Hebrews, it doesn't matter who wrote it. It's an excellent book. But Luke is a prolific writer and a very intelligent one, writes beautifully clear Greek. And he then wrote of things before the cross in the Gospel of Luke and things after the cross in the book of Acts. So he really knew what he was talking about. Now, if Luke is deceiving us, we're deceived. I'll grant that. I don't think Luke sounds like somebody who's trying to have me on. Why would he bother? Because he suffered a great deal for his preaching, too. He's mm -hmm. very sober, very down to earth, and he knew people like Mary. He could go to Mary and say, well, tell me about this virginal conception that you had. Find out. Mm -hmm. So he really knew what he was. He was actually there. Normally, you don't say, well, I know better than somebody who was there. If there's a car accident, for example... And people were standing on the side and they saw exactly what happened. You don't come along half an hour later. Well, let me tell you what really happened. That's just silly. That's just arrogant. So I'm accepting Luke as speaking the truth here. From morning till evening. I mean, we're doing this for two hours, let's say. 
from dawn till dusk. And Anthony, people expected. complain going to a, a church service that the preacher spoke more than 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> How would they have done here? <laughs> he explained things. You've got to be explaining. Testifying, there's that legal term, making a testimony. That's a divine statement in the presence of God and Jesus saying something about the, oh, there it is again, the Vasilia. I'll give you the Greek, the Vasilia to Theu, the kingdom of the one God. That's what it is. And trying. It was a lot of work, by the way. He didn't always get paid. And sometimes he, he asked not to be paid. He had that choice. He also was allowed to be paid as a minister. That was okay because the worker deserves his, his wages sometimes. But that was entirely optional. But he was nevertheless trying to convince them. That takes argumentation point by point about Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets. So there it is, the kingdom of God and Jesus. Isn't that exactly Acts 8, 12? Mm -hmm. Exactly the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And then he was talking to Jews, by the way, there. And some of them said, yeah, this is exciting stuff. We want to hear more about this. Others said, wait a minute, you guys are an idiot. They didn't want to listen. So then Paul stayed for two whole years now in his own rented quarters. He really was a prisoner of the Roman government here, but he was allowed a certain amount of freedom. And he welcomed everybody who came to his uh, his apartment, if you like. What was he doing for two whole years? Heralding the gospel of the kingdom of God and teaching them about the Lord Jesus Messiah with complete boldness. That's mm -hmm. a wonderful way to end the book of Acts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because we are without excuse if we don't now see that Christianity is firstly about the kingdom. It is patently obvious. So you've got a wide world out there, all of, all of you who happen to, to come on this video that we're making now. You've got a very expansive world. You've got this miracle of the internet. So get busy, preach the kingdom of God everywhere. And people mm -hmm. will be very grateful and thankful that you did. Well, and Anthony, if we look at Jesus's parables, yes. almost all of them were teaching about the kingdom. Totally. Yeah. Well, let's start here with the Luke uh, yep. here, 4 through 15, and yep. um, just to maybe go through and share what's on your heart about yes. this parable. And yes. um, Did you say Luke or Matthew? Luke? Was it Luke 8, 4 through 15? Yes. We'll find the Matthew parables in Matthew 13 and repeated. Why three times over? Have you ever thought of that? Why have you got three gospels to repeat? Because it's so important. That's the people, that's the thing people avoid. So you're right. Luke 8 will do beautifully. We could equally well do Matthew 13. Well, you can whichever one you'd like, and then just maybe comment as you go Absolutely. through it and tell us what you would, because like you said, this is one of the most important parables. Well, let's do Luke 8 because it uh, it is just so excellent. It says in the first verse of Luke 8, I'm looking at the New American Standard Version, any translation would be good. The King James is not ideal because the English is foggy and difficult and it's just wrong in some verses. No translation is perfect. The New American Standard Version does quite well or the RSV or the RV. doesn't matter. You'll get the sense from any of these translations. So soon afterwards in 8.1, Jesus began going around from one city and village to another Proclaiming and preaching. Two words for heralding there. Gospelizing, proclaiming, heralding. What is it? Oh, we're not surprised. It's the kingdom of God. That's, of course, what he was doing. And his disciples were with him. His students, the 12, were his chosen disciples. One of them went wrong, as you know, lost his apostleship. That was a tragedy, but that's another story. The 12 were with him. And also some women. We're not missing out on the excitement. We've been healed of evil spirits or demons and sicknesses. Mary Magdalene, and she was had really been in bad trouble. She had seven demonic presences in her. And the others, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who was Herod's steward, and Shoshana or Susanna, and many others. And in verse 4, when a large crowd, I wonder how many that was, thousands, I think, thousands of people were coming together from the various cities. They were journeying because they'd heard about this Messiah Jesus fellow who really had, shouldn't miss him. So he spoke by 
means of a parable. A parable is simply two Greek words meaning you throw one thing alongside another. We have the word ball in English, bole is to do with throwing balls, but alongside. So you put this thing alongside something else to make a comparison. Like life is like a box of chocolates. Well, it's not mm -hmm. normally, but that's a parable. It's a very clever way to teach because it's vivid for people. So here's the parable of the sower. I'll just comment on this fact that Mark says, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of them. So you concentrate heavily on the parable of the sower. And here's what he said. He likens himself to a sower. I mean, that's the best agricultural metaphor you could possibly do. I'm not a farmer, but I know enough about sowing seeds that if I put beans in the ground, they come up as beans. So I, I know what he's talking about. The miracle of putting a seed in the ground, and after a few days, something comes up through the earth. How does that happen, by the way? So it's a very powerful metaphor, illustration goes out to sow the seed. And then he tells of the four different conditions that that seed might encounter. Some of it falls on rocky soil. Well, first of all, some of it is by the, by the side of the road, gets trampled on, doesn't go anywhere, right? It's a disaster, it gets absolutely nowhere. Secondly, some falls on rocky so soil, grows up, but withers because it had no moisture. I get that. We have to be watering in Georgia quite a bit these days to keep things alive. And then seven other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it. So that's the sad part of the parable. However, other seed in verse eight fell onto good soil. You're getting the point. People are like soil here, different categories of people. Some people are careless about what they hear. They're not very uh, persuaded, very much persuaded. They're very sloppy with what they hear and varying conditions, different personalities will receive or hear this seed in different ways. And seven says, uh, yeah, some were just choked. Now, eight, eight. Eight is the number of perfection. The number of Jesus in Greek is 888. One's super over the seven. Eight in the eighth verse of Luke 8, easy to remember. Seed fell on good soil. People who were receptive grew up and produced a crop. And that is a, apparently, farmers tell me this is an absurd amount of stuff. You, know, you don't get this in real life to this degree, but it was hugely successful. And then Jesus said this famous thing, if you've got ears to hear, don't miss this, because your destiny is at stake here. You don't want to miss out on this because you are going to be indestructible in the kingdom or you're going to be burned up in the lake of fire. That is a considerable consideration. But it Can might I be. comment here, Anthony? For yes, please. No, absolutely. When Go we ahead. look here where the sower was sowing his seed, you know, he's throwing it out here yeah. and some's going on the path, some's on in the rock, some are the thorns and some ends up on good soil. That's like us when we're trying to preach the kingdom. Yes. When we do these videos, when you write your material and books and different things mm. like that, you're sowing yep. the seed and you don't know where it's going to land. But exactly. that's not your job. Your job is to sow the seed. Absolutely. And those who are seeking or have an open heart and mind, God will somehow yes. help them to find that seed. But if we're not throwing the seed out just everywhere, if we're thinking, oh, I should only throw it out here or over there. And uh, another comment would be if we're leaving out the gospel of the kingdom, that'd be like breaking the seed in half and only throwing a half seed out. What can grow if you have a half a seed? You're not an evangelist at all. If you don't preach the gospel of the kingdom, you haven't got off square one. You're absolutely right. So the disciples then, they were interested students. Disciples are students. They began asking the teacher questions as to what this parable, this comparison meant. So he explained it to them. To you, my chosen students, it has been granted by God. That's what we call a divine passive. It's been granted by God, that is, to know or to understand the secrets now revealed. Not a mystery that nobody can fathom, because these secrets are being explained by Jesus here of the kingdom of God. That's the topic, as we will know. But to the rest, it is all in parables. And here the meaning of parable would be a sort of a, a genuine mystery, something we don't understand. It would be mysterious in the worst sense. And what happens if it's not understood? 
They see, but don't see. And they hear, but they don't understand. Quoting Isaiah, it is a very interesting thing. People either see and understand or they don't. Now, don't imagine that God ordained it that way. You make a choice. We know from Deuteronomy we're supposed to choose. Every human individual has a choice to make. And if you don't choose right, if you say, I'm not interested in this, sorry, that's not my thing, then God will give you over to a spirit of delusion so you wind up believing in even more lies. So really we're all of us on trial when this parable comes to us. So in 11, he said the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. And I have to say immediately, that doesn't just mean the Bible. I won't turn to it now, but we'll just refer to the fact that in the parallel in Matthew 13, remember Matthew 13, Luke 8, Mark 4, the parable in its parallel in Matthew 13, it says the seed is the word of the kingdom. Ah, of course. If you are not talking about the word of the kingdom, you're not talking about this parable at all. It's got to be the message about the kingdom. It's not a message about being a good chap or improving your life or trying to rescue this world from its own mistakes. Not that. It's the parable of the coming kingdom, the destiny of the world. And then he goes on to explain, which is really quite obvious. Those by the roadside, they hear, but they don't get anywhere because the devil comes, as we said earlier, shows what the devil is doing. It's very interesting to know what your enemy is doing. That's part of a good strategy. The devil doesn't want you to hear this message of the kingdom because he's afraid if you, if you believe it, you might get saved. And that's the last thing he wants. And Anthony, if, if we were so yeah. excited about it and it was getting preached every weekend, there would be a lot more seed being thrown out there. And That's he right. doesn't want that either. Of course he doesn't, no. He's done a pretty good job, I would say, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, and Anthony, it doesn't mean you have to have a sermon on the kingdom of God every Sunday. But no. as Jesus did, as we see here, he incorporated it into pretty much every one of his teachings. Absolutely. And that's what really Absolutely. ingrains things in us is when we're hearing it in different yes. ways, not that it's just a lesson on that topic. No, 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 exactly right. The kingdom must be the basis. And uh, I often write to people and say, I, I'm, I appreciate what you're doing, but I don't hear the kingdom of God as the fundamental underlying basis of everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. So then you know, the rest of the story is rather clear. In 14, the seed, oh no, 13 is most important. Must comment mm -hmm. on that. Those on the rock is so they hear the message of the kingdom. When you're teaching this, you must keep repeating the message of the gospel of the kingdom. They hear it and they receive it. They say, whoa, this is great. I love it. But the problem is they have no firm root. They believe for a while. I don't know, how, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or 10 weeks. I don't know how long. But they're temporary. They get excited, but they don't maintain the excitement. So that's where encouragement from other people comes in. So they don't bear any fruit. It's all about fruit, isn't it? You've got to produce from your seed something that comes up in the ground and ripens and is fruit. It's all about fruit bearing. And that's where you get in what you get in 15. The seed in the good soil is the ones who hear the message of the kingdom. It's the oh, word. 14, Anthony. Oh, 14. The seed which fell among thorns. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. These are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way through their life, they're choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life. And they don't bring any fruit to maturity. I understand that this time of year. I'm looking at our fig trees here in Georgia. Beautiful figs are forming. They haven't come to maturity yet. You can't pick them and eat them yet. But if we go on without any terrible frost that might kill the whole lot, I don't think it'll happen now. They're going to bear fruit. But these people didn't bring any fruit to maturity. I get it. And in 15, then, the good soil, these are the ones who hear the message of the gospel of the kingdom. You have to keep repeating that phrase, gospel of the kingdom, in an honest and good heart. I like that. Some people have an honest and good heart. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, they're all miserable sinners. I get that, too. But there are people who have an honest approach to life, and they do very well, like the Bereans were more noble-minded. That was a good quality. So teach your children to be noble-minded, and they hold fast. They cling on to this message of the kingdom as though it's the only thing that matters, which is true, and they bear fruit with perseverance. This really isn't very hard, is it? Is this difficult? I don't think this is difficult. 
I didn't mention, I should have, that in verse 8, where it says, other seed fell into the good soil and grew up, produced a crop a hundred times as great. And as he said these words, he used to cry aloud. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating. He really got excited because this sower parable, he was actually determining the fate, the destiny of human beings. So your life depends on this. This is not just some Bible teaching that you heard one day and to, oh, mildly interesting. No, no, this is your destiny. You who are listening to this, you either are going to believe it and succeed and become indestructible in the future kingdom, or you're going to let it go and get on with other things which don't really amount to anything. So that's mm -hmm. the test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and we see here, Anthony, in this last part where Jesus explained it, like you said, yeah. You know, some of them they hear it and then the devil just takes it away. So that yes. I mean, they they just Gone. don't care at all. Mm -hmm. But the ones on the rock that, like you said, they receive it with joy. The people are excited to hear about it, but nobody keeps talking about it. Nobody keeps discipling them. I think that's where discipleship comes in. Right. We need to disciple people, not just you know throw Absolutely. the seed out and walk away. And they believe it for a while, but then when it's they're tested then yes. they fall away and we all will be tested. And one of our lessons we were going through the other day, you were talking about, this is a time of testing. And um, yeah. And then the other one about the thorns, they hear it, but then they just kind of keep going on with life. And, you know, they're worried about everything. They're more mm -hmm. consumed with, you know, making money and the pleasures of life. And as you said, the fruit doesn't mature. So there might be a little bit at one point and then it shrivels up and dies. Right. And, and the, the good soil, like you said at the end, it bears fruit. So I hear a lot of people sometimes, they believe the gospel of the kingdom and who Jesus is. Yes. And then I think they're like the parable of the talents where the one person who just buried his, he yes. didn't invest it. And we know what that parable ends as. So we don't yes. want to be that servant, you know, as a Christian, we don't want to be the Christian that just buries what Jesus gave us to do. And when he comes, he says, what did you do with it? What have you done with your life? Absolutely. And he takes it away from him. That's pretty scary. It, Jesus is a very tough teacher. Uh, you know, he wasn't so much concerned about the atheists and the agnostics. He's very hard on those who thought they were Christians and weren't. Mm -hmm. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, look what we did. We preached in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did all these wonderful things as Christians. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. What? I don't find that easy. I don't like that as a teaching, but I can accept a very tough teacher. And if you want to be sure about somebody, before you let them loose in a new government, you want to be sure what they're made of. So this is trial and testing time. Makes perfect sense, actually. Well, he, he's a tough teacher, Anthony, but he, he was willing to walk before us. Yes. And he doesn't ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. It says that he laid his life down for his friends. Yes. Are we willing to lay our life down for him? And not necessarily, does that mean someone has a gun to your head and say, you know, renounce Jesus or die? Yes. Are we willing to lay down this life right now? Yes. Well, you know, our, just what we enjoy doing, our hobbies are, you know, depending on where he's leading us for work or school or family and things yes. like that. Are we willing to lay those things down for him and it's take up our cost. cross and follow him? There's a cost to be paid, obviously. Is, That's reasonable. Cost. God gave you life in the first time, first place. And I used to say to the students, what talents have you got that God didn't give you? The answer is none. All the talents you have have come by way of genes and experience and surroundings and so on. The question is, what are you doing with your talents? Mm -hmm. None of the talents are something to brag about because God gave you all those talents. It's a question of whether God is going to say through Jesus, speaking through Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. Inherit the kingdom which God prepared from before the foundation of the world. That's in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word of the kingdom. That was God's great idea. I get it now. This began to make some sense. But in the Church of England, they didn't explain any of this to me at all. Well, a lot of churches don't. And even the churches that understand it don't talk about it that well, much. Well, that's, even, that's even worse. It is. And, and so... Yeah. Jesus, though, he, like you just said, it's not arrogant on our part. Jesus even said, I just tell, speak what the Father tells. I, this isn't from me. That's right. 
And and we have that same attitude. That's exactly right. Yes, that's very striking in the Gospel of John. He keeps saying over and over again, the words that I'm giving you are not my words. Uh, if you believe in me, you're not believing in me. That's striking. Of course yeah, we, we have that in our introduction yes. on the Bible lessons. If people like want to go listen to that, yeah, that's that was you really. Believe in me, you're believing in the Father who gave me these words. That's a very striking way to teach. If you're believing in me, you're not believing in me. What, what are you saying? Oh, I get it. The words that you gave us are God's words. So he, uh, He's putting all the glamour away from Himself to His exactly. Father. Exactly. Yep. Right. Um, I'm going to ask you to just comment on the parable of the mustard seed. Would you like yes. me to read it from Mark, Luke, or Matthew? No, you can read it from Mark, I should think. It would be fine. Okay, so it says, he also asked, to what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use to present it? Yep. It is like a mustard seed that when sown in the ground, even though it is the smallest of seeds in the ground, when it is sown, it grows up, becomes the greatest of all garden plants, and grows mm -hmm. large branches so that the wild birds can nest in its shade. Yes, exactly right. And that's actually from Daniel. That whole idea is from Daniel. So, yes, it's a very small seed. Mm -hmm. But here's where you need to be careful with this parable. He's not here saying that the kingdom of God is going to expand all the time now until the second coming. It starts very small and it will remain very small and it will become massive as a worldwide kingdom where the birds can rest only when Jesus comes back. So we need to get out of our minds the idea that we are going to change the world apart from the second coming. We can make a difference, certainly, and we should try to make all the difference we can, but it is very small. The seed is small relative to the size of the world and other seeds, but eventually, and people miss this, when Jesus comes back, then the kingdom will have completely free range and the devil will have been bound so that he can deceive the nations no longer. We're up against the devil. The devil has a lot of power and he will exercise that power snatching the kingdom message away as conscientiously as he can until finally he's bound in Revelation 20 so he can deceive the nations not a, a second longer. Then that mustard seed will become hugely worldwide it won't you, be against the opposition of the devil do you think that we could look at it it's almost that it's dormant in the sense of the final outcome yeah. of it not that it's dormant in our life now but if we think of like holy spirit it says that when you're baptized you receive gift of holy spirit mm -hmm. and that says that that spirit is put in us as a down payment could that yes. be kind of like that seed that's in us yes. as a down payment we have mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be realized, the whole right. idea of what we talked about at the beginning, what the kingdom really is, until right. we are resurrected and made immortal and glorified yes. like Jesus was. Good parallel. And there's a place in First Corinthians where some of the Corinthians thought that they were ruling the world now. Paul says, you must be kidding. Mm -hmm. You must be joking. We're not ruling the world. Then he says... Would to God that we were ruling the world in First Corinthians 4, so that we apostles would be ruling with you. I wish the kingdom would come. But I think that's a good, a good parallel you draw there. The spirit is a down payment, but it's not the inheritance fully. So mm -hmm. forget the idea that we are going to achieve the kingdom of God apart from the future coming of Jesus. Now, there are a couple of texts, very rare, where the kingdom is said to be a power working in your life now. I'll Grant all of that, it's fine, through the Spirit. But let's say that 98% of the kingdom texts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke refer to that future coming, particularly the one in Mark 11.10, where it says, Blessed is the coming kingdom of the Messiah. You could do some Bible study on that, but you'll find the kingdom is mainly and predominantly that kingdom which doesn't begin that's why Joseph of Arimathea was waiting for the kingdom long after Jesus had showed up. Had he missed it? No, no, of course not. So the real thing is looking for the kingdom in the future, and that is Christian hope. Hope is most important because Paul did say in one place that your hope is based on love and faith. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Sorry, the other way around. Hope is the basis. I should put it this way. Hope is the basis for which you have faith and love. So if you're short mm -hmm. of faith and love, you might want to brush up on your hope a little bit, like <laughs> getting a clear kingdom 
message in your mind and practicing it yes would you comment briefly on mm -hmm. the verse that a lot of people like to use against these ideas in mm -hmm. terms of the kingdom of god is within you mm -hmm. oh absolutely yes i'm glad you mentioned that one it's luke in luke 17. this one is most interesting and we've been helped with this verse particularly by somebody from uh, princeton university uh, richard hires First of all, let me just tell the anecdote. Uh, I used to go to the American school in London to teach German and French way back in the 80s, long time ago. And as I waited on the train station to go there day by day, I would see Salvation Army people. So I would go up to them and say, I'm writing on this question of the kingdom. Please tell me, what do you understand about the kingdom? And invariably, without exception, the only kingdom verse they knew was in Luke 17, the kingdom of God is within you. That's in the King James. That's almost certainly a mistranslation. And it doesn't even mean the kingdom is here because the king is among. It doesn't even mean that. It's more significant because if you read the whole chapter, you'll find that the kingdom of God is not going to be localized. Jesus says in this parable in Luke 17, don't rush off and find the kingdom in the wilderness or go over there and find it somewhere else. It's when it comes, it's not going to be localized. It's going to be like lightning shining from east to west. So that's the lesson about the kingdom. It's a spectacular event that nobody can miss when it happens. It's not in your heart now, not in this parable at least. And it's not simply something that you work, work at expanding now. Now, we should be doing what we can, of course, to spread the truth I think you gave a very nice talk on abortion recently. That's very important. You're teaching children what is right and wrong. All of that is what we should do. But the kingdom hope is certainly the coming kingdom. That's why you're praying, may your kingdom not spread exactly, but may it come, may it arrive. Arrive. That's the work. emphasis. That's and, and we go back to the verse, uh, Matthew 6, 33, is yeah. seek his kingdom first and his righteousness. Of course. And then the things that you need will be given to you. So yes. we need to be working on that both. Uh, I'd yes. like to address a couple ideas that have crept into yes. Jesus's solid kingdom teaching and really weaken the mm -hmm. true understanding of our hope. Yeah. And I think there's a phrase out there in reference to the kingdom, like already, but not yet, or that idea. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. How do you think this undermines Jesus's teaching? Well, this is George, George Ladd, who was a, in many ways a good Bible teacher. And he said, you know, the kingdom is both not yet and already. That's not entirely wrong, but the emphasis without clarification is fatal. It sounds as though it's equally now and equally future. The balance is horrible there. It is mainly, predominantly, I would say 98% of the time, kingdom mm -hmm. statements refer to the coming kingdom. That's what you have to stress, especially because people believe the opposite. When you teach, you have to try to see, well, where, is thing, where are things needing to be corrected? So to correct it, I would say the kingdom of God is not yet 98% of the time. 2% of the time, you could argue for the presence of the kingdom, the spirit of the kingdom, the down payment of the kingdom, the preaching of the kingdom should be present. That's all fine. But by no means get that out of balance. There was a chap called C.H. Dodd, very famous British preacher for whom the future kingdom was anathema and the public has no idea how some scholars hate these ideas. I mentioned Calvin in Acts 1 6 where he says they're all screwed up. These poor disciples didn't know what they were talking about. That's completely false. C.H. Dodd said the kingdom is simply something in your heart now that is equally false. So get the balance right and see that the kingdom is not yet there's the text in Hebrews where it says, we do not yet see everything subjected to Jesus. That's mm -hmm. very, very important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will get a foggy, watered down, vague, um, unclear idea of the kingdom. You don't want that. You can ask yourself, are you ruling the world now? Hmm. If you can say, you're, you think you're ruling the world with the rod of iron, you must be joking. You're not. Therefore, the kingdom hasn't come. Oh. At that point, you turn to 1 Corinthians 6, 2, where Paul said to the disciples in Corinth there who were having disputes among themselves, he said, you people are completely missing it. Don't you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians there, that the saints are going to manage the world. That's the Moffat translation correctly. You're going to be in charge of the whole world. 
You mean you can't settle your little disputes now? You mm -hmm. must be joking. How in the world do you hope to manage um, the affairs of the world, Scotland, Ireland, the whole world, if you can't even settle your disputes now? And there Paul says, I wish to God, to use our modern expression, that we were ruling in the kingdom. Then that would be great. The kingdom would have come, but it hasn't. So oh. there's so much in the Bible about that, yes. Anthony, in the West, I mean, we live a pretty decent, comfortable life. And oh, so I do. think people are kind of focused more on, you know, we you're do. building this kingdom now aspect. Yes. But if you think of people in North Korea and Haiti and a lot of these countries, I don't think any of those people would say that they're anywhere close hey, right. to God's kingdom in right. their countries. And we kind of neglect to, to look at that. Uh, did you want to comment on the counterfeit seed in Matthew 13, 25? Yeah, let's go to that one, Matthew 13. Uh, tares, right? This uh, is an interesting Greek word because apparently the tares here are counterfeit wheat. So you've got the devil is very clever. He's always counterfeiting, playing games with us and produce something which looks like true, but it's really being, uh, it's really false. And therefore you could be scammed. And uh, what was it in Matthew 13, 35, you said? Um, let's which see verse here. was that? The parable of the tares, right? Yeah. 30, so, yeah. Matthew 13, 36. I was looking at uh, on the chat here, so let's see where it was. Yep. Um, the tares are certainly there in 37. The one who says the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus' mm -hmm. favorite self-designation from Daniel mm -hmm. chapter 7. He says the good seed, which is the seed of the kingdom, Matthew 13, uh, that famous verse never ever should be forgotten. The seed is the word of the kingdom. Yeah, 30, here, 25. Yeah. Yeah, 35. 25. 25. 25. Matthew um, 13, 25. Oh, okay, the one. Yeah, okay. He presented another parable in 24 right there. Mm. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed. That's exactly right. But while people were not paying attention, they were sleeping spiritually. The enemy, the devil, came and sowed fake wheat and seed and went away. But when the wheat sprouted up and bore grain, then the fake, phony, pseudo mm -hmm. seed also sprang up. And the slaves, the servants of Jesus, the landowner in this case, came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good kingdom seed in your, friend, in your field? How in the world, then, does it have fake tares, T-A-R-E-S? And he said to them, an enemy, meaning the devil, has done this. And the slave said, well, do you want us then to pull out the fake bad seed right now? And he said, no, let them grow together until the harvest. The harvest mm -hmm. is the end of the age. We learn that in Matthew. That's the second coming. So the bad seed is the fake Christianity, isn't it? Must be the phony Christianity. And our job then is to discern the difference. The phony Christianity would be the idea that you can sow the seed of the kingdom now and effectively change all the governments and everything will be fine before Jesus comes back. That's just wrong. Quite wrong. You can be a political activist and work for this, that, and the other. And that's just wrong. You've got to be sowing the seed of the future kingdom mainly. Out of that comes your good Christian life. That's true. But it's a subtle thing. You can see how can people can get this wrong if they're not careful. Well, like you said, Anthony, because the tears look so much like the wheat, this isn't talking about Buddhism no, no. or, or no. Is, Islamic religion or right. you know, anything like that. This is, this is somebody sowing seed to make something look like Jesus and his message. Absolutely. But it isn't the same. It's not the same, and we have to monitor each other. We have to monitor our own students mm -hmm. and try and encourage them to get this right. There's a book by Wiley Jones at our mm -hmm. site mm -hmm. on the Gospel of the Kingdom, which everybody should read. It's not long, just a few pages, but it sums up, I think, extremely well what we're talking about. I just want to mention one quote, if I may, from uh, the commentaries, which says this. The prophets in the Old Testament speak of little else than two topics. Mm -hmm. Number one, how and why God's people may be expected to be punished by a variety of disasters soon, <laughs> number one. Secondly, 
why they may expect to be rescued and restored and saved eventually. That's exactly right, the bad news and the good news. Uh, for instance, the book of Ezekiel is occupied with two great themes, the destruction of the city and the nation and the reconstitution of the people and their eternal peace. So the book falls into two equal divisions, 24 chapters for the bad side, 24 chapters for the good. Another statement, the book of Zephaniah falls into two general divisions, chapters 1, verse 2, to chapter 3, verse 8. First of all, a threat. You better shape up or else. A judgment threat on the world and on Israel and on the nations. And secondly, the promise of the kingdom, the promise of the new dawn uh, breaking eventually. Finally, in Isaiah 9, 1, there will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. Mm -hmm. So it is going to be trouble right now. Through much tribulation, we're destined to enter the kingdom. But the dawn is going to break every morning. The light comes up. You think, ah, that's a symbol of the dawn of the coming kingdom. And as you say, when we wake up in the morning, we're practicing resurrection. I think we are. We're supposed to go. It's very clever the way God has, has organized the laboratory in which he's put us, isn't it? <laughs> Yes. So, I, Anthony, we're yeah. going to be moving on okay. to a few questions we have okay. here. But before we do that, yes. could you just comment, too? And I think one of the questions uh, maybe yeah. uh, is about this as well. But yes. do, do you think the church, or like a lot of people preach, I know you don't think that, the church mm -hmm. is building God's kingdom now. Are we in the process or the business of trying yes. to make everything right now? No, we're not. Obviously not. The kingdom is predominantly and firstly... Proprement dit, as the French say, properly speaking, the kingdom is not here. Otherwise, Joseph of Marimathia would not be waiting for it. Come on, that's just obvious. And Luke 19, 11, they thought the kingdom was going to come immediately. And Jesus said, well, you idiots, of course it's here. The kingdom of God is right now. It's not. No, he has to go off to get the kingdom come back. So I would use Luke 19, the parable there. And it's going to take some work to get people straightened out. We're not just building the kingdom now. That would be to the detriment of the real Christian hope, which is thy kingdom. Come, not thy kingdom spread. Well, and the Great Commission wasn't go make this kingdom come. It was preach no. it. Exactly We're right. Supposed to be getting this message out because yes. of the coming kingdom. Yes. And, and, yes. and that's what we need to be busy with. So if you haven't gotten your question in in all caps, please do that. And I will be pulling up Rick's question. He has a few questions here, yes. Anthony. Rick and he says that. you can take your pick, but if you'd like to maybe just read through here and comment on it. The first part is, is there any biblical basis for Christian nationalism before the parousia? Yes. As many U.S. evangelicals believe. What's your thought? Yeah, on my that? thought on that is no, there is, there's no nation that is Christian now. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of God only at the seventh trumpet in Revelation. There is no political nation right now that is the kingdom of god if there were you would go to that kingdom you'd find the messiah sitting on the throne of david you won't find it so that's a, a very interesting question and the answer is definitely not yet right, the first right. Year, and then the first thousand year reign the millennium are the judgment thrones in revelation 20 to be occupied by no no good question not martyrs only that would be very unfair. If only people who died for the faith got to reign with Christ, that would be sickeningly wrong. No, every true believer, whoever they are, whether martyred or not. So that's a popular misunderstanding. Every true Christian, including Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and all the prophets, Abraham was not martyred as far as I know. So mm -hmm. that's just a, a very interesting question. I'm so glad he asked that. Mm -hmm. And then and three. Then, is three? Jesus sitting on the great white throne in Revelation 2011? Well, it does say that all judgment is given to the Son. So I'll mm -hmm. leave that one open. God uh, can assign Jesus to be doing that second resurrection there. And I Christian think one died, of the lessons yes. we did, Anthony, that's addressed a little bit too, but there are multiple verses that tell that God has given that authority and that judgment yes. to the Son. That's right. Um, number four there, when a, yes. a Christian dies, isn't it more comforting to tell their loved one 
that their <laughs> spirit is now with Jesus. And I think it was too long here, so it didn't get all yes. opposed, opposed to just resting and sleep, I would presume. Yes, well, I would never ever tell them that their spirit is now alive with Jesus because you'd be lying to them. And that's the one thing you don't want to do. You are to speak the truth at all costs, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. But you can, you can comfort them with this, that they're sleeping the sleep of death, Daniel 12, verse 2. There's no immortal soul to go anywhere. It doesn't exist. They are going to be resurrected. There's nothing greater than that hope. So, Isn't that more exciting? Yeah. They're going to be brought back to life and you'll see them again. I, I, well, I think so. Well, look at Absolutely. Thessalonians. It says that encourage each yes. other with, they're telling us use this to yes. encourage, right? Is it First uh, Thessalonians is yes. it two or four? Chapter four. Uh, yeah. With these were encourage each other with these words, and the words were certainly not your loved ones have now gone to heaven. That would be very depressing, by the way, and totally unbiblical. So don't even mention it. Right, yeah. right. So can you explain Luke seventeen twenty one, please? That's the one that we talked about earlier. Okay. The kingdom of God is within you, right? That's right. Okay, so we got so this translation. The King James is just wrong. The right meaning there is the kingdom of God, when it comes, will be all over from east to west. Mm -hmm. Can you explain kingdom now? Dominionism, what do you think? It's wrong. You cannot have the kingdom of God now. The idea is that we're going to work hard and produce the kingdom in America. It ain't going to happen, as we say here in Georgia. It's not going to happen. No. You preach the gospel of the kingdom. And you invite those who are going to be the rulers with Jesus in that kingdom to get into training now mm -hmm. through suffering, through persecution, and so on. But no, dominionism is a, as bad as post-millennialism, the idea that the millennium happens. All of that goes back to Augustine, who didn't understand this well, and Calvin, who understood it even less well. Well, even his disciples in Matthew 24, it starts out by them asking him, "Are you gonna? when is this going to yeah. happen? Yeah. Or was it after his resurrection or when, when they said, is this now when you're going to bring it? It's all about Jesus bringing it. It wasn't about them doing anything. No, that's right. And of course, in Matthew 24, they did ask about the buildings that were there. That's a, a very good point. What they knew from Scripture, I'll say this, Jesus had read the Bible very carefully in the Old Testament. He knew that there would be trouble in the temple connected with the second coming. Mm -hmm. I'll repeat that. He knew there would be trouble in the temple closely connected with the second coming. I don't mm -hmm. think Jesus knew whether that was going to be AD 70 or not. That's a bit radical. He mm -hmm. didn't know the time. All he knew was it's going to be trouble in the temple. As it turns out, that's where you explain to your friends, that 70 AD was not, I repeat, not, not, not the coming of the kingdom. Why would Jesus know? He didn't. He just knew the prophecies, which knew Trouble of the king in the kingdom, uh, sorry, trouble in the temple, the abomination of desolation standing where he, as he there, in the, in the Greek there, where he ought not to. He knew that, and he knew that was associated with the second coming, well, as it turns out, it's future. Right, go ahead. Yeah, and he told us, go back and look at Daniel when he talked about the totally. abomination, what Daniel talked about, and that's where we get a lot of our uh, yes. information. And here, Rick uh, right. had a follow-up that it doesn't say Jesus, but him who was seated on it, the phrase used uh, by God, for, or for God the Father by John throughout Revelation. Yes. Maybe comment on the agency, because I... Yes, I, I, grant, I grant that. I, there are two, two texts then that are difficult to reconcile, because it does say that God has given all judgment to the Son, but you're right, the one, I think, presiding over that that resurrection and judgment would be the Father. So I'll, I'll leave that a little bit open. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, what about here with uh, Revelation 20? In Revelation 20, is the first resurrection metaphorical? <laughs> That's an interesting question. We appreciate all these questions. They're very genuine. What in the world is a metaphorical resurrection? Listen, you're either resurrected or you're not. There's no such thing as waffle words like metaphorical. Of course not. It says that people who are resurrected had had their heads chopped off. What is metaphorical about having your head chopped off? Nothing. So <laughs> you always do literal treatment of words in the Bible until you've got obvious, obvious uh, metaphors. For instance, we know that trees don't clap their hands. You don't have to take that quite literally. But where you can take it literally, as in Revelation 20, 
by no means waffle it away into nothing because you're losing the teaching that way. So that's literal resurrection, absolutely. Two of them, actually. One before the thousand years and one after. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah. why did Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world in yes. John 18, 36? Great question. My kingdom is not of this world, doesn't belong to this world system. The present world system, the devil is deceiving the entire world. You'll first find in First John mm-hmm. five eighteen, I think. The devil has a large degree of control in this system. This evil age, this present evil age will last until the coming age of the kingdom. And so Jesus' kingdom will be completely beyond this present evil system mm-hmm. and as different from it as Satan is different from Jesus. Mm-hmm. Amen. And I appreciate all the comments people putting in. May your yes, kingdom yes, totally. come. A lot of uh, people watching tonight, thank you for Good. tuning thank in. You. Thank you. And um, we have a couple more questions mm. here. Apart from Daniel, where else can we preach about the kingdom from the Old Testament? Yes. Like Paul. Absolutely. We can do it from all the prophets. I would start with Isaiah chapter 40 onwards. But that's an excellent question. The prophets only say two things. I was just reading. The prophets say two things. The bad seen now, but wait till the kingdom comes. So go to that second half if you're looking at that, and you'll find that true of all of the prophets, particularly Isaiah, Ezekiel, of course. Daniel is the purest and straightforwardest of all of that, if you like, but you get it. You just have to plow through the Old Testament prophets, mm-hmm. underlining all of your kingdom of God material. You'll find that very fun, very fun thing to do. Yeah, I think we'll end with this question here. Yeah. Uh, great question there. Thank you, ah. Brother Carlos. What must happen before the kingdom comes? That's a, yes. a, a huge question. And, you know, we've done a lot of yes. work on the end of the age and, you know, how Daniel talked about those yeah. last seven years and then the abomination. And yes. I'm going to be hopefully putting out some things on that as well to get a little deeper into that. Hopefully I'll maybe bring you back on for some okay. of that. Yep. But maybe it briefly yeah. address uh, well, some of these things that must happen. Briefly in Matthew 24, it says that this, go- this gospel notice, this gospel of the kingdom, the one we all know is the gospel. That's not true today, but they did. This gospel, well known, must be preached worldwide. Now, I don't know the extent of that. I have no way of knowing how long that has to happen, or I would imagine would be pretty much worldwide. And with internet, we can do it if we work at it. We've Mm -hmm. all of us got to work at it. And then he said, the end will come, meaning the end of the age. That part I know. But beyond that, no date setting. The date setting business has been a failure forever. We do not know exactly what date the second coming will be. We do know, I think, that there has to be a temple rebuilt in the Middle East. That's highly likely. The reason I give for that would be that Paul said, when you see the man of sin sitting in the temple, I stress the article there, when Paul introduces you as the church, he talks about you as a temple. You individually are a temple. You collectively, when introduced, are a temple. But when he speaks there of the man of sin sitting in the temple, most likely he means a real building. So watch out for that. Anything you report on that would be most useful. Send it over to Tracy and we'll find it most interesting because there's a lot of talk about that right now in the Middle Mm -hmm. East. Now, it looks like we have one more question Mm. here. Why did Jesus say the kingdom of God has come upon you? Yes, well, that's that's one of the very rare presence of the kingdom verses. When uh, this is actually a case of exorcism, if I, uh, Jesus speaking there, if he cast out a demon... I wouldn't say that we're doing a lot of exorcism right now. We're not doing the spectacular miracles, not to the extent that Paul and Jesus were. And the reason for that was that the gospel started with a big flurry of activity. That's in Hebrews 2. Lots of miracles to confirm the gospel. You don't put out the balloons every time you open a shop forever. So there is a lessening of the dramatic miracle going on now. But if you were to be exorcising demons, and I'm sure that can be done in rare rare occasions, then the power of the kingdom has invaded your life. That's what's meant by that one. I think in regards to Jesus, the miracles and things too, Anthony, um, we see in different situations when he did these things. I believe that those miracles were showing us what the kingdom 
is going to be like. We're going to have resurrection, even yes. though like, you know, Lazarus wasn't resurrected to immortality, but we see resurrection. We see healing. Yes. We see all those things that are in the end of Revelation where it says there's going to be no more death, no more dying, no yes. more pain, no more sorrow. And I think he showed us those things now so we could see them that this is th those were all yes. examples of this coming kingdom as well. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, the point we should make is that apostles have special powers that we don't have. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me this week, was Judas an apostle? I said, absolutely he was. But he failed. He lost his apostleship, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. by betraying Jesus. But yes, he's listed in Matthew 4 as one of the apostles, mm -hmm. but he mm -hmm. lost that. But otherwise, you have to have seen, you have to have seen Jesus literally to be an apostle, uh -huh. and you have to have the accrediting signs and wonders of an apostle, and people today don't have that. So some sort right. of thinking along those lines, I think, is useful. Yes, exactly. And um, we were talking about the focus on the kingdom, uh, yeah. what would, uh, what happens when we die, the booklet's yes. there, it'll be on the new uh, website that I mentioned that yes or the web uh, page anyway, is the Good. Bible lessons that we're working on that I showed at the beginning. Yes. And I wanted to just bring this up. And I know it's you have all this on your website as well. This is yes. on my website. Um, oh, yes. But Our Fathers Who Aren't in Heaven, a great yes. book to understand uh -huh. this a little bit more if you're interested okay. in sharing. And then yes. um, the amazing aims and aims claims and of claims, Jesus. Right. We're talking about what Jesus taught. And I'm sure there's a little bit in here. Uh, you know, the secret of immortality. Oh, and this is, is a lost. free PDF, the coming kingdom yes. of Messiah. And you yes. can see here all these different languages. So if you know friends, you have friends yes. that are, there's so many people here in yes. America now from different countries. Uh, if you have yes. a Chinese friend, it's probably better to share the PDF in Chinese with them. I, I know Absolutely. I speak a Russian. I'd still rather read in English. And so yes. I think that's very helpful of people. So right. um, if you're able to take a look here, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of free PDFs. Who is Jesus? Good. And then um, the what happens when we die. It's a free PDF. The They're free PDFs that yes. you can just click on them. And uh, let's see. Uh, it opened Good. in another thing. So that didn't show for you all. But just click on it. It will open there. And mm -hmm. uh, you can find that there. And then, um, again, if we you want to go to the Bible lessons page here, yep. what we have here already, like Anthony was mentioning uh, about accepting Jesus yes, and yes. the John 12, 44 through 50. And then yes. we started in again with the kingdom hope, what happens yes. when we die, hell, uh, the yep. two resurrections, and then we'll be uploading Good. the difficult texts and moving on to Good. other things from there. So well, thank you for all the work you've done there. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that you keep going strong. And, you know, we, we never retire, Anthony. When you have a calling and when, <laughs> when God has shared this with you and he's that's given right. you a job to do, you don't retire until you retire. No, that's you know, right. And it's a blessing right. and a privilege working yep. with you. I appreciate uh, yeah. everything you do and the example yeah. and that you were able to yep. join me here tonight. Thank you so much. You, pr you produced that forum. You did. You are the one that organized the forum by which this happens. Well, That's very, very good. Keep at it. Yeah. And, you know, thank you for discussing this important topic. And yes. it really should be the most important topic to us because it was the most important topic to Jesus. So you do you like have Jesus. any last words about the gospel of the kingdom here for us? Well, only that you sound like Jesus. If you're talking about the kingdom endlessly, you sound like Paul. If you don't talk about the kingdom clearly, you don't sound like Jesus. You don't sound like Paul. So I would worry about that. Get on the kingdom bandwagon, if that's the right word, and then you will begin to resonate with the Bible. You'll understand the Bible much better. It's a kingdom book. It's all about who gets to rule the world. The answer is you do. You and Jesus are going to fix the world. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, you say, poor little me, I'm nothing. Wait a minute. God can use your talent. He gave you that talent. Get busy using it for the kingdom cause and the kingdom destiny. Amen. And Anthony, I do appreciate all the people that joined us here. A couple of comments yes. um, that uh, they'll come up here. Um, your conversation was very Good. faith strengthening. Oh, Shelley, thank you, Shelley, Shelley. for joining us and uh, appreciate Good. Sarah and Carlos joining us as well. Yeah. And appreciate all the work that you guys put into oh, yeah. everything. Thank and you. appreciate Michelle and all the work she does behind the scenes, helping us out as well. 
and we uh, appreciate her Thank comments you. and sister Sharon up in Canada. Oh, yes. and thanks for bringing that to the table. Yeah, thank and, you. Um, appreciate uh, Rick, uh, his questions. Yes, there. absolutely. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, Michelle likes my lavender flowers. My daughter went back to the <laughs> mailbox to bring them for me. So that was a blessing. <laughs> so, But I, I do thank everybody for joining us and those that will be watching later. Yep. And uh, really encourage you to please like and subscribe here. Uh, it helps to get the message out. Yes. And appreciate that greatly. And uh, we just want this essential message to reach more people and have this right. kingdom seed scattered all over the internet. I think the new Roman road, Good. it's getting all over to all the nations Good. and to Good. get this hope out to the nations before right. Jesus returns. Good idea. Couldn't yeah. be better. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. And you as well, Anthony. Thank Thanks you. so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And God bless. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.